Okay, I'm Mark Johnson and welcome to the second lecture for the first week in biology. Today we'll concentrate on the scientific method. I'd like to give you some insight about what you're reading in your book uh, in relation to how a real scientist does this job. And I did it for 30 years and I still think like a scientist, of course. So let me get out of the way here. Well, I'll just get out of the way. Okay, and this is a slide that's in your book in, it, in the PowerPoints uh, that is on the companion site with your book. And if you look at this slide, we have these steps in the scientific process. First is observation, which leads to a question. And what's left out here is literature review finding out what we already know about this. Just because we see something doesn't mean that somebody else doesn't know all about it and hasn't published something we can read about it. So we have to check that out. We do our literature review. And then we develop a hypothesis based on that. We think about what we might, what might happen. We make predictions and we set up an experiment. And the experiment is done we get a result and then we either reject our hypothesis because the results of the experiment didn't support that hypothesis and then we get another hypothesis and repeat this over and over and over. We go through iterations until we finally think we understand what's going on. And then we develop big conclusions, big ideas about this and we might if the experiments are completed time and time again with the same result, we might form more than a conclusion. We might come up with what is known as a theory, which is a conclusion that everybody accepts, that there's an explanation for the phenomenon we've observed that everybody accepts as truth. Uh, but of course, uh, it might be wrong. And sometimes with uh, better research methods and new developments, we can uh, learn new things about old ideas and then we come up with a new theory and a new hypothesis and a new theory and sometimes that's called a paradigm shift because the paradigm is the way we view the world and sometimes we can look at things a totally different way because now our understanding is more complete and that's called a paradigm shift. So let's look at the way uh, a scientist would actually do his work. And by the way, you might want to print this out, set it aside so that you can, uh, or at least pull up a piece of paper on the side with a pen or pencil that you can take notes on so you can compare what I'm going to tell you with this, uh, this diagrammatic uh, representation of the process. So the scientific method, and I'll come back into your life here for a minute. The scientific method basically starts with an observation. We see something, and that something makes us wonder about what it means and what it was that we actually saw. It may be something that we just don't understand. For example, once upon a time, I uh, observed broken pieces of fern laying in grids across the entrance to mountain beaver burrows on the hills on the Olympic Peninsula in Washington State. It was my first publication. I uh, I went about examining multitudes of these hillsides and found that in almost every case the bracken fern fronds had been snapped over and uh, covered the burrows. Well, the Olympic Peninsula is a very rainy place and my hypothesis was, which I published, not a theory, a hypothesis that I published based on observations was that mountain beavers, Aplodontia rufa, were apparently 
covering their burrow holes, entrances, with a lattice of rack and fern leaves to keep the rain out. Maybe that was true and maybe it isn't. I don't really know. Anyway, uh, that's what I saw and I came up with that idea. So we, we see something and then what we actually do is we do a literature review. We look in the literature for information on the same phenomenon that somebody else might have studied and published the results of. So we want to find out what people already know. That's what we do. And this follows um, the type of outline we also follow in our publication of our results of our experiments. So we do a literature review. And after we do the literature review, we combine that information with what we saw. And we might just say, oh, well, everybody knows about this. Let's throw it away. Uh, for example, I saw a long-tailed bobcat one time. And I thought that was so unique that I sent a picture of it uh, that I happened to get, uh, luckily, uh, into the American Museum of Natural History to, a, to the curator of mammals, who I knew, Dick Van Gelder, at the time. And uh, he sent me back a list of uh, references uh, full of photos and, and uh, of this. And it turns out that I was probably looking at uh, a cross between a house cat and a bobcat. And that was nothing new. It was fairly commonly reported in the past. So uh, my idea of something brand new sort of blew my socks off. And I had to just forget about that. But if it's something that we don't forget about, because there's a literature review, and we saw something, and we come up with a hypothesis that's new, um, then we develop this question. And we state that question. This is what I think might be happening. or this is the question. Um, and so we develop a hypothesis. And then we set up an experiment or a study. Uh, this is hard to do for a biologist working outside because we have a hard time controlling the environment. But our experiment has an experimental design that will allow us to evaluate the results using common probability theories or otherwise known as statistical tests. And uh, a lot of people don't understand statistical tests, but for those of us who do, that's a really powerful tool and really neat. Our experimental design must include controls. and Next to the controls are levels of treatment. So that we can see what the response is relative to how much input that we desire to have in the system. For example, we might want to study how fast grass grows relative to the intensity of solar radiation. So we may grow our grass underneath different levels of shade using uh, shade cloth or different densities of screening uh, to accomplish that. Then the other thing we do is uh, we will have replications. Now our replications are sort of like the iterations in that diagram. If we can do enough replications, then this will mean um, that if our results turn out to be consistent, any conclusions we draw will be much stronger and uh, more acceptable to reviewers. So we have a um, results where we demonstrate our data, and then we have discussion. And a lot of times, we will have a discussion and conclusions. The conclusions uh, may be negative. It may be that we didn't learn anything. But if we think we learned something and we can conspire <laughs> with ourselves or with our partners to elaborate on those uh, beliefs that we now have, 
uh, then we post those. And then this uh, has to go to publication. And this is one thing that uh, your diagram lacks, is publications. Um, if a tree falls in the forest, does anybody hear it? If nobody is there. If you do not publish your results, then you didn't do the work in the first place. Obviously, nobody will ever know it ever happened, even if you actually did do it. So publication is extremely important. It lets everybody else in the world know. Now, before you go and think that somebody just prints this stuff, it doesn't happen that way. Publication, this is a photograph of me on this uh, magazine cover. Uh, when I was doing some research with clover pasture growing under trees in a project called an agroforestry project. Um, when we publish the results, we write a paper and we send it off to an editor. The editor sends it off to reviewers and the reviewers comment on um, both our writing quality and the quality of our experimental design and research. And if they find it acceptable, then the editor may schedule it for publication as long as we can come up with the dollars to pay for the printing costs. And yes, we don't get paid for publishing. We, get, we pay them to print this. Uh, it's a professional society thing. So this is the one aspect that I would add to what you're reading about, and that is that we shall have we shall have publication of legitimate experiments before the world will accept whether or not uh, we've done a good job and whether or not there might be new information for the world to share and uh, which might lead to a new theory. Generally we will not discover new theories. Uh, that will be uh, elaborated by a consensus of people who have repeated the experiments over and over and over. And as I say, it is very difficult to do these experiments in the natural environment because no two places are exactly the same and it is very difficult to create controls. Um, innovative scientists can figure out ways to get around some of this and sometimes um, we simply compile observations until we see so many things happen in the same way that we develop conclusions for that from that um, but it, it is a matter of repeating over and over and over um, some experiments or observations and eliminating those things that don't fit those ideas that don't fit and then accepting those ideas that seem to fit and ultimately refining and improving those ideas in an organized way. And it is one of the reasons that your communication skills and your adherence to the APA citation policy and reference formats uh, required by Globe University are so very important. Uh, professional communication requires certain standards and uh, the ability to communicate professionally and clearly uh, has, uh, will have a dramatic impact on your future ability to earn money because employers always favor those who communicate uh, in the most professional way. Have a good week and uh, we'll talk to you next week about DNA and carbon-14 dating uh, and some other interesting topics hopefully. Thanks.